Vasudevayam. Haribo. So we've been on a little bit of a journey. We started with hearing that the mind can be one's greatest friend, but if unbridled, it is your greatest enemy. That's which is quite a stunning thought. And the next major area that we looked at was the idea that unlike being a good surfer who most of the times may be able to ride the waves and have a good experience, if one attempts to ride the waves of emotion, you will wipe out. It doesn't go anywhere else. If you become moved, if you catch the wave of rising emotion, whatever it is, positive or negative, and this begins propelling you forward, it always ends in misfortune for you and for others. And then last night we looked at some of the external forces that actually influence the mind and act on the mind. We touched on that one a little bit. And that was sort of interwoven also, you know, through all the other things that we talked about. So I'd like to begin this morning by reading a verse from the Kata Upanishad that gives the most amazing way in which one can think about the connection between the body, the mind, and you, the actual self, the spiritual being. And it states, the individual is the passenger in the chariot of the material body. And the intelligence is the driver. The mind is the driving instruments or the reins. And the senses are the horses. The self is thus the enjoyer or sufferer in the association of the mind and senses. So it is understood by great thinkers. So this is quite, quite a graphic example and really easy to appreciate. The five senses pulling the chariot, the body is like the chariot. And then you have five horses pulling it. These are the five senses always looking for things to experience and to try and find enjoyment. The horses are connected to the driver of the chariot through the reins. The reins are compared to the mind. And the driver is what is called the intelligence, which is not, it's, this is an idea that's sort of not very familiar to people in, in most of the world. The intelligence here doesn't mean how good you can, or how well you can remember things, or how good at math you are, or how good you can, you know, do those kind of things. This intelligence, or buddhi, has the capacity to actually control the mind. And we mentioned that it's like, you know, when a person is in a situation and they're getting sucked into something, and they're going like, 
you know, they're just going with it and then they can hear that little voice, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But we're doing it anyway. You know, we're not listening to that. So this faculty that we have, which is part of the, the material covering, this faculty is the faculty that we can learn to strengthen and utilize to live a more happy and peaceful life. It is this faculty that gives you the ability, even when the mind is raging in fear, in anger, in desire, in you know anything, this is the faculty that can rein it in and say, I'm not following that. I mean, it's so liberating when you actually come to grasp that you don't have to cooperate and follow whatever your mind is doing. It's going to do what it's going to do. You do not have to follow it. You do not have to identify with it. You don't have to wallow in it. If you exercise no intelligence, then you will find that you are constantly being swept away. All you, I mean, anybody here that suffered from severe depression, I mean like severe depression, will be able to tell you how the mind can, is the greatest enemy. I don't know if you ever saw, there was a movie, like this is old, The War of the Roses. <laughs> it, it, it was... It, it was like a really long time ago, and it was kind of hilarious. It was like a husband and wife, you know, and then they start getting into this fighting scene, and they live in a fabulous house, and they've got all these possessions and everything, and they just go, they end up going on the war path with each other. And, and then they're going to have a divorce, and then they're just deciding, well, I'm, not, I'm going to make sure the other person doesn't get this or doesn't. And they end up wrecking their whole world, destroying everything, just because they don't want the other person to get it after the divorce. And it's just like, this is the insanity of material life. This is, this is not an exaggeration. The mind will do things. I don't care what happens. <laughs> I'm doing it anyway, you know, and and yeah, you'll get into trouble. I don't give a shit. I'm doing it, you know. I'm going to stick it to that person. It's like, oh, that's really intelligent. <laughs> you're so, you know, focused on sticking it to someone that you're going to have some horrific consequences. I don't care. <laughs> and of course, all the time we're using the pronoun, I don't care. We're not relating that I to the eternal spiritual being. That I is the false concept of the self, the body and the mind and all the crap that's going on there. It's, it's, it is founded on ignorance when we use the pronouns like that, identify the body as the self. So this intelligence really gives you the capacity to step back from things. And, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the program that we run in the prisons. You know, these guys just are amazed because I've never heard anything like this. And a lot of them have come from unbelievably sad lives. The way they grew up as children and the things that they were exposed to and they just became nasty angry people they they don't know how to cope and they're just lashing out and you know they commit all this criminal activity but they end up suffering so much you see it when people get overwhelmed with anger they don't care they say they don't care what happens to them they're going to do what 
they're going to do the damage. And it's like, you know, I mean, it's, there's nothing more insane than people going off in an argument and somebody started smashing dishes or smashing stuff in the house like, oh, why? that's a really good idea. Let's smash it all. <laughs> <laughs> and then later I have to clean it up and then I have to replace it. It's like, whoa, yeah, I really I really showed them. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I showed them how stupid I was. You know, it's just that we 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 lose all all perspective. So, you know, in teaching people how to how to develop mindfulness, to be more mindful in the sense that I begin to actually listen to my intelligence. And, and I, I think about it, I remember what we've discussed, references and guidance from spiritual texts, and the advice is hit the pause button, step away, go calm down. Go do some meditation. Think about it. Then consider what's in my best interest and what's in the other person's best interest as well. And then come back and try to figure out a way forward that actually achieves something. I mean, can you imagine how good your life would be if you could do that all the time? I mean, if you actually applied that, wouldn't your life be kind of like pretty far out? rather than being just responding to things and just going with the emotions and just going with whatever's sweeping over you. The tendency of the horses on the chariots, they want to run. They just, they're driven by whatever external stimulation they receive and the modes of nature, particularly the modes of passion, they just want to run. And they need to be directed. Because if you drop the reins and just let the horses go, it's a crappy ride in the chariot. <laughs> it's bumpy, it's dangerous, you're going over all kinds of ground and swerving, and you know, it's just, it's horrible. And so if you just let the senses and the mind run free, we're, we're, I'm working with my daughter and a, and a filmmaker from Hawaii. We're doing a documentary on the alcohol and other drug treatment court in, in New Zealand here. And it's like, it's really interesting because we're dealing with people that have been, they have a whole history of criminal activity. And what's the underlying driver is often an addiction to drugs, or including alcohol, alcohol and other drugs. You know, alcohol is recognized as a drug. And when people become dependent, when they become addicted, it's like they have utterly lost control of their life. And there's this really nice woman that is a peer support worker in the court. She herself has come through this whole process of being a raging, out-of-control addict on, on meth. And um, she was talking to, to um, us about... She says, you know, she offers each of the peer support workers, they and their caseload is about 25 people that they support. And they touch base with every week. They help them manage their roller coaster crises, you know, that you go through and trying to come to this more stable and steady platform and come out of this life of insanity attached to addiction. And um, she, you know, has, of course, the names and phone numbers in her phone of 20, 25 people. But she says as soon as somebody doesn't show up for a drug test, they have to do random drug testing. Mostly the people that come up before the court, 
they're looking at at least two and a half years or more in a current sentence for things, and they're offered the opportunity to go through a life transformation. And if they succeed after perhaps a year and a half it takes to graduate through these intensive programs, then they come before the judge and the judge can decide, okay, you, I'm not sending you to jail. I'll give you six months probation, but you have to stay, you have to do this, you have to do this, you know, to really help shape people's lives. So uh, this, <clears throat> she says, you know, of these people that she's meant to be peer support, if any of them don't show up for testing and then bail on the program, and if you bail on the program, then there's you're given about a week or two weeks, and if you don't resurface and show some remorse and want to get back on board, you are arrested. There's a warrant for your arrest, and you go directly to prison. And usually when people fall off the wagon, as they say, it's, it's a wild time. People go to extremes sometimes in using and stuff. And she says, if anybody, you know, within a week is not really contacting her, if they've really run and they're hiding from the law, she has to delete their contact in her phone. Not because anybody's telling her to. She said she knows what she's dealing with and where she's come from. She said, if I maintain a friendship with these people thinking I can help them, the chances are I will get pulled into their world. And as soon as I go back into that world, I will lose my car, I will lose my house, I will lose my husband, and I will sell my children. And it was like, whoa! <laughs> you know, that makes your hair stand on end, that you can be so out of it so much in the grips of the mind and its demands and, you know, this addictive behavior that you would even, you know, consider selling your children if you were so desperate for money. And, of course, people do everything and anything. They become utterly degraded just to feed the habit, which is feeding the mind. So, you know... When we, when we learn this, we develop this habit of hitting the pause button. I mean, actually consciously making an effort. It's true that the only thing that you really need to do is chant these transcendental sounds and everything's going to be okay. But if you want to actually work on things, if you want to speed up the process you have to be willing to do certain things yourself, things that you need to avoid and things that you need to embrace. And to develop a practice, every time you cross that line and you act under the influence of the mind and desires and emotions, to try and close the gap where as soon as something's happening, that's it, I hit the pause button, sorry, time out, I, I need to step away, it's not you, it's me, I need, I need to step away and calm down, I need to figure out how best to respond to you so that we can actually have a better life, we can move forward. To be that honest, to be able to say that, and do that and begin to practice that. It just increasingly strengthens that faculty known as the buddhi or intelligence and gives you an increased ability to take charge of your life. Instead of being a slave to the mind, the senses and the desires, you actually become the master of the mind, the senses, and the desires. And you direct those towards that which is spiritual. And you will have a, a wonderful life. And you will have, even more important, a wonderful death. It will be wonderful. Okay, 
anybody have any questions? Was that was that interesting? Isn't that a good analogy? I mean, it's a, it's a perfect analogy. And I tell you, every time you fall over, every time you do what you know is wrong and not in your, the spiritual being, in your real interest, you need to reflect on it. You don't wallow in it and, and never get into the realm of self-pity. The self should not be pitied. The self is a glorious spiritual being. When I talk about self-pity, I am calling my mind and my body the self. Yeah, you should feel sorry for the mind and the body. <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> where that thing's going to go. <laughs> you know? But that's not the self. But when people cling to the idea that this is the self and then they pity that this is the excess of influence of the mode of ignorance which leads people towards depressive states and the inability to feel that you can do anything about it you just want to give up you just don't want to get out of bed and just pull it that that's that whole scene is when the self is truly lost and the intelligence tells us no throw off the covers get out of bed go take a shower you stink you've been in bed for three days <laughs> go eat something refreshing go get some exercise you know one of the best things you can do for depression eat something healthy and go get some exercise get out in the air and another thing that was really helpful, show some concern for others. Because as soon as you do something for someone else that snatches you out of this horrible little self-centered world where it's all about me. There was this interesting guy, I'll just close with this one before you do questions I'll get to you in a sec there's this interesting guy in, in prison he'd been in there for a really long time like really long time and um, he was so depressed about his fallen condition and the nature of the crimes he had committed which were very horrible and his life and he felt that there's no way out and he contemplated suicide and he thought about it repeatedly over time. He planned how he was going to do it. And he got to this point where he really figured this at this day, at this time, in this place, because they have to be out of their room, their cell, you know, and to go to this place where nobody was going to be able to see them and he was going to, you know, try to kill yourself. Let me just say this one thing before I continue. You cannot kill yourself. That's bullshit. You continue to live. All you do is kill the body. You move on and you bring your mind with you. You think you're suffering now. You kill yourself. It's out of the frying pan into the fire. It does get worse. <laughs> People need to hear that because this whole idea of suicide is just bullshit. It's so harmful and so crappy. Anyway. Back to this one. So the guy, he goes to this place to try and so-called kill himself. And there's somebody already there in the process of going to kill himself, supposedly. And he saw this person and he saw their distress. And he, and he felt so bad for the guy. And so he went and, and, and started talking to the guy. And he actually talked him out of doing it, even though he was planning to do it himself. He talked himself and helped the guy out, and you know, they went and talked, and then he got really absorbed in just helping this guy through his crisis. And I said, "So, and what happened to you? Did you go back and and do the deed?" And obviously not. I'm talking to you now. I said, "What happened?" 
And he, he had never thought about it. And I said, what happened is you move from being utterly self-centered to actually caring about someone else. To, to attempt to engage in suicide, it is the, the deepest pit of self-centeredness. But unfortunately, it's not the real self that one is centered on. It's the fake covering, the artificial covering, the body and the mind, which is not the self. And it's when you, someone gets totally absorbed in that self-centered world that the suffering is at its peak. But as soon as you shift your gaze onto someone else and you see somebody that is in need and you reach out to do something for them, to show some kindness, to show some care, that really dissipates and even evaporates. Is that far out or what? That's really far out. So these are, these are really important little gems that we can incorporate in our life, in our attempt to live a good and healthy, a satisfying, a happy and peaceful life. Yeah, Tim, you had a... Sorry, I... What about? What about? <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing japa and the mind is, you know, like a bit more on a subtle level rather than a you know, dramatic front, how it just keeps interjecting and, and trying to manifest its own yeah. kind of path. How to, how to deal with that. Okay, we are, and thank you for that question because I, I was wanting to talk on that subject. We are not in, in the practice of trying to destroy the mind or totally, you know, just blow it up or anything. Nor, we recognize, nor can we completely control it. When, when Krishna spoke to Arjuna about some of these yoga processes that involve intense activity to control the mind, Arjuna's response is like, oh my God, this is so impractical for me. The mind is obstinate. It is powerful. It is impossible to control. I feel that it is easier to control the wind than my own mind. <laughs> and of course, Krishna you know, tells him that by appropriate means, it all becomes possible. So uh, we're not in the business of, you know, if your mind has wandered in your meditation, you don't beat yourself up, you don't get all distressed. You just recognize, hey, that's the nature of the mind. It's gone for a cruise. And so I just say, hey, come here, boy. We're heading this way. It's like taking the dog for a walk. <laughs> the dog cannot walk in a straight line. They don't know what that means. They just like following their nose, whatever's going, you know, just like all over the place. And if you, you just get a little tug on the leash, here, boy, you know, and then the dog comes like kind of goes along. If the mind is like really raging, we have to deal with it in the same way that you would deal with a totally out of control kid. When the kid is throwing a raging tantrum, overwhelmed by the modes of nature and just going crazy. You know, you can start shouting at it. Like, that really helps, doesn't it? Immediately they snap out of it. No. There's a certain things you can do to make them snap out of it, but we won't go there. And what, what, what do you do? You give it a warning. Look, behave yourself or we're doing a timeout. And they're still raging. Okay, go to the room 
and you may have to bring them and close the door. And then you're back and doing what you need to do, housework or preparing lunch or whatever. And it's still raging in the back room. (laughs) But it's now become a bit muffled. And you know, you just have to tolerate it for a little while. And just remember, the definition of tolerance is to patiently endure unhappiness. (laughs) So... We just put up with it. And we know it's going to run out of steam. And eventually the kid will calm down. Then you'll hear a little voice. I'm good now. Can I come out? (laughs) That's what we got to learn to do with our mind. When it's on a rager, when it's overwhelmed with sadness or, you know, feeling depressed or lustful or angry or fearful or whatever, it's, sorry, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not on this train, right? You're going in the room. We're closing the door. I know you're doing your thing, but I'm just going to go ahead and do what I need to do. This is the use of the intelligence or the buddhi. And it gradually the, it calms down and you can let it out again. But a big part of the spiritual practice is to frequently put spiritual content into the mind. And that purifies the mind. And eventually the mind falls completely under the control of you, the spiritual being. In which case the mind has now become the best of friends. Because it's so filled with spiritual content there is this constant smaranam, this remembrance of wonderful things, of spiritual thoughts, of spiritual ideas. Okay? So that's how we deal with it. Don't focus on the mind. Because then you're falling under its control. Oh, it's driving me crazy. I don't know what to do. I'm like, I, I, I can't get a good... You know, no, you, we've already lost the plot. Yeah. Tell me something I don't know. The mind is troublesome. The mind is difficult to control. Yeah, so what? We need to get on with things anyway. In the Does things even like intense physical pain become obsolete because there's an understanding that you are not that pain? Um. <clears throat> it, it is possible to become entirely unaffected by even physical pain and discomfort. One of our spiritual teachers from about 500 years ago, he wrote the most extraordinary spiritual text. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And during the time that he wrote this, he was said to have been so plagued with a severe arthritic condition that he said there was no position sitting, lying, or standing when he was not experiencing severe pain. And yet when you read the work, there is no indication of anything like that going on. So what, what does happen is that a transcendentalist, it's not like that they don't feel pain. The pain may be there, but it has its place. And one learns to tolerate rather than focus on it. And one becomes at the same time so steeped in amazing spiritual experience 
They're experiencing great transcendental ecstasies and things in spite of what's going on in the body. And it just becomes like, you know, something you've got to deal with. Your body is like, and, and mind, could be like an old beat-up car. And you still need to get from point A to point B. And you know that you can't drive over 40 kilometers an hour, it's going to blow up. You know that you may have to stop every 5 or 10 kilometers and put more water in the radiator. The back wheel may have this terrible wobble, and so you just drive it how you need to drive it to get where you're going. And so one should learn with their body and mind to respectfully treat it for what it is and utilize it for the most noble thing that you can utilize it for. You know, this quest for real spiritual realization, for enlightenment, for the awakening of true spiritual love. Okay? Is this cool or what? Yeah. But the hard part is you've got to do it. There's no point. It's not that there's no value, but there's not so much point in hearing about things but not applying them. You, you, want, you want the experience. You have to do it. And each of you is able to do it doesn't mean that it's not going to be challenging and difficult. But we're not dependent upon ourself. Our process is what's called the descending process, the path of revelation, as opposed to the ascending process where it's by my strength, by my goodness, by my power, by my focus, I'm going to ascend the mountain. No, I become... I become deeply dependent upon divine grace. Please gift me with the intelligence. Gift me with the strength. I cannot do this alone. One of those things I say in, in before speaking, and, Hey Krishna Kauruna Sindhu, O oh Lord Krishna, you are an ocean of mercy. Not a little bit. You are an ocean of mercy. Dina Bandhu. Bandhu means the greatest friend, the most dear friend. Dina means those who are poor. When we think of poor, in the material sense, we think of some destitute person living on the street. But there can be a poorness of heart due to being overly immersed in material life and having suffered so many unpleasantness and difficulties and feeling I can't meet the challenges of life, that poorness of spirit. And it is Lord Sri Krishna who is this Dina Bandhu, the actual friend of the poor. Everything that you need for the highest spiritual experience you actually have already received here. You need to do the walking though. Put on your walk in shoes and hit the road. There will be times when you deviate and fall down and wander off and take a break. And when you find yourself in that situation, it's just pick yourself up and one foot in front of the other. You will be gifted with everything. The intelligence, the strength, the determination, these are, these are spiritual gifts. Yes. yes. I've you know, talked to a few people about 
their journeys over these last few years a lot. In particular, um, I see that um, a lot of people struggle with understanding what to prioritise in their life. Um, could we speak about that a little bit? Again, I, one of my couple of friends left before the talk today, and I thought, gosh, if that was me, I'd be staying for the talk. You know, but I, I didn't say anything, but I think differently. And um, what would you recommend in this respect about how to look at our plan for life and what to prioritise? Well, can I also add to that, though, um, everybody's in sort of like a different place and a different situation and what one person may come to appreciate as being actually really important and should be more prioritized. Another person may not be in, in that situation. But it, it is what he said is, is true that over time, if we make even a small commitment to developing a personal spiritual practice, it, it's so important to regularly engage and to cultivate a spiritual practice. This is called sadhana. And as one engages, one will experience more attraction and more strength to make deeper commitments. It, it is important to come to the point of, of having such clarity that you know what is of value and what is not. That which is eternal is of value. That which is not eternal, that which is temporary, is of no value. But don't have to be extreme and artificial. People are going to move you know, th along the scale in their own pace, in their own time. They will, they will do it. And so, you know, we can encourage people to, to try and take advantage of situations and to help them grow. But at the same time, you know, you can't make rules about it. Everybody has to show up at this time on this day to do this or you're going to hell. <laughs> I think nobody likes that kind of messaging. But what he said is nonetheless important. You know, we need to be constantly reflecting on what is actually important and to try and take advantage of opportunities that come to us. And f feel free, you're a good friend, to encourage people to do that which is important. But take care when you do it not to push somebody away. Sometimes people are in a state where they're kind of like, you know, and then uh, they got pressured some way or other, and it was kind of like, you know, and then maybe they feel guilty or they're angry about getting pressured or they feel really bad about it. And so, you know, they might just head off in another direction because they don't want to have to deal with that. So, you know, the idea of, of learning to develop priorities and, and regularly revisiting that, what are going to be the actual priorities in my life, is really important. And that which brings you to that spiritual end is important. That which perpetuates material existence is not only unimportant, it is harmful. Okay? Good enough? <laughs>
I'd uh, like to mention something because um, I found it so amazing. I was listening to a lecture with uh, Para from Srila Prabhupada the other day, and, um, and he was saying the mind's like an echo chamber. So you never do anything once. So if you do something good or something bad, it's not once. Because yeah. if you do it, it echoes yeah. throughout your life for quite a long time. Yeah. Mm. So we have, we have been subject to lifetimes of material conditioning. We have automatic go-tos. We have these automatic responses that we've developed. And by learning to engage in, in spiritual activity, yeah, then you that becomes more of what you hear and you remember it and you revisit it and it pops up again and you go, yeah, I should be there. And it's absolutely true and the opposite is also true. You know? I'm really cool because if, you know, if, if you have a really hard time in your life, yeah. if you've been practicing spiritual life, when you're having a really bad time, you've got echoes of positivity yeah. and spiritual things coming through that and kind of carries you through it. If you've been doing crappy things and then you have a crappy time, it's just yeah. more crap. <laughs> And, and connected to that, just the fundamental message and idea that when you're going through hard times and when you're going through times of material happiness, this too shall pass. It doesn't last. It can't. It's impossible. So even when you're on the highest peaks of material happiness, you go over and it goes down. Sorry. It can be an avalanche. <laughs> and the same thing with exceedingly distressful situations. This too shall pass. And learning to separate myself, to recognize this is all going on in my mind and I'm overwhelmed by it, but I don't have to remain bathing in it, wallowing in it, that this is the center of my life. Okay, all good? Oh, we got another one, yeah. Um, sometimes, um, you don't necessarily realize that things that we're doing are not helpful or even harmful. And other times we know that, oh, this isn't a really good habit or good habit, yeah. but we're not necessarily prepared to give Make, it up or change. Yeah. So how would you deal with that sort of situation? There, there is no alternative to cultivating the regular habit of meditation and spiritual activity. The principle of spiritual association, this is called sangha or satsang, is so critically important too, simply because we are put into situations that help to reinforce and constantly remind in those situations. And so we if we don't recognize something and later we think about it, we can be prayerful. We can be considerate. You know, I wished I could have been aware and conscious of that. If I am finding it difficult to give up something, behaviors or things that are not helping me spiritually, I can ask, please, give me the strength to at least be aware of this more, to be more, you know, aware of it, so that I can seek to the help to move beyond it, to move past it. Two things you need in spiritual, your spiritual journey, patience and determination. You have to be patient with your own mind and with all the material conditioning. You have to be patient that the spiritual process for most of us will take time because of how deeply conditioned we are and how much we still cling to material ideas, concepts, consciousness. We need to be patient. 
we need to have a trust that the spiritual process works. I, I have had such, I've been so blessed in my life to have so much wonderful association with people sometimes who are just even very humble and are not very, you know, noticeable as it were, but who are, you can see over time have embraced these practices and their life has transformed so much in the most wonderful ways it's just like wow you offer all respects to these people even though they may be so uh, humble and quiet and be you know just not someone that stands out it, it is a powerful process so there needs to be a conviction, a trust that, yes, it works, because I can see it in others. And I particularly see it in, in very advanced spiritual personalities. The determination is that when I encounter a roadblock in my, in my journey, then I consider how am I going to get past this? And I can try to muster the resources at my, that are available to me to go under it or around it or over it to move on. But even when the obstacle is so great that I cannot get around it myself, I can ask, please help me move past this. And I can be elevated over it, around it, past it. So that determination means no matter what I encounter in my journey, no matter how many times I fall down or stray, this is what I'm doing in my life. This is where I'm going in my life. And I'm not not going to give that up. This is what I'm doing. This is patience and this determination. Yeah. Um, what's the best way to help someone that has been coming along and, and you know, has encountered maybe more pressure than they really were ready for? Mm -hmm. um, or just make them feel... Uh, they don't come, that they'll be judged by that on a regular basis. What's the best way to help them? Tell them that the judgment is wrong. <laughs> really? You know, somebody's pressure, you just tell them to piss off. You know, the only time that people can actually give pressure is if someone is an actual, genuine spiritual master and somebody has come to recognize that person has actually been an empowered representative of God, they've come to that position and they come and place their heart at the feet of such a person and says, I offer you my life. Then that person has a duty to put some pressure and some firm direction because somebody has come to that kind of a stage. If somebody doesn't have that kind of a relationship, then one needs to be really cautious. It's not cool to be putting undue pressure, to have encouragement. You know what I mean? That's something else. So if somebody is kind of withdrawing because of pressure, Oh, yeah. You don't have to listen to that. <laughs> I mean, what's been said is probably right and true, but hey, you, you don't have to be pressured by that. Do the best that you can do. It's about, oh, round two. Um, there's transcendental goodness. Talk about the goodness. Is there also a transcendental counterpart for passion and ignorance? No. The material modes of nature are of the material world. 
the only spiritual counterpart is this Shruta Sattva, the transcendental goodness. Vandalam. This is there are nine specific activities that one can engage in on the path of, of bhakti or devotion. One of them is, is vandanam or prayer. But what is important is to learn how to pray. And I'll give you a little example. Within Christianity, for instance, and, 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 and with almost all you know, religious faiths, Because people do not understand the distinction between themselves, the spiritual being, and the body, when a person becomes absorbed in the a notion or idea that I am the body, if I want to address some higher spiritual being or God or you know a higher state of perfect consciousness or whatever people may relate to that, my tendency will be to ask for stuff that's actually not going to help me, that's going to increase my material conditioning. One of the... There was one early saint in the Christian church, um, St. Francis, who actually drew a distinction between, for instance, even the desire for liberation and the desire for the attainment of love. And he said they can never go together. They are incompatible. Because the desire for liberation is a self-centered desire. A person may be addressing some higher reality or God and asking, please save me. But in that prayer... I am at the center and that powerful entity is out there and I am asking that entity to render me some service. Whereas in the realm of spiritual love, I don't ask for anything. My prayer is, how can I please you? It's just like, this is a really advanced subject that really takes some time to, to consider. But, you know, generally when people try to address God or some higher spiritual reality, they ask for crap. Help me with my exams, help me with my relationship, help me with my kids, and, you know, who knows what. The health of my body, which is actually the only thing that's considered really, from a spiritual point of view, okay. To ask for good health is, is reasonable and a good request. But other things is not advised. And so in this regard, the transcendentalists always try to, they've got a, a saying to walk in the footsteps of the acharyas. So my name is Acharya Das. The word Acharya means one who is a perfect spiritual teacher who teaches by their own example. It's from the root word Achara, which means you know your conduct. And I have a little Das on the end, which means I am the servant of the great spiritual teachers. That reminds me of what my eternal position is. And it is said that one must learn to walk in the footsteps. It means that you must tread where they have gone. You must learn from what they have learned, and you must live how they have lived. And in doing that, when we read the humble and submissive prayer of great transcendentalists. This teaches us how one should pray. 
and it makes it so that we don't deviate into, you know, praying for that which may not be really in our best interest. Big subject. That's a short summary. Oh, we're still going. Looking at the clock here. Yeah, okay. It's related to that about pleasing <coughs> God. Um, sometimes it gets quite clear what's the voice from the heart and what's the voice from the mind, but sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure if something would be pleasing to God or not, and how yeah. can we become better at that. So we, in, in, in the whole spiritual process, there's three authorities um, Guru, Sadhu and Shastra it's called which means the great the spiritual preceptor the great spiritual texts Shastra and, and the previous saintly persons but then there is a fourth authority and that is the Lord who sits within our own heart, who is also called Chaitya Guru, which means the guru within. This is not you. <laughs> There's a lot of people that try to promote the idea that this is you, and once you get it together, then you'll merge into that and you'll experience your own godhood. And, and that, no, that's, that idea is not an authentic Vedic idea at all, although it's promoted as such. And I can debate that point if anybody wants to. The Lord within our own heart is the Paramatma, the, the Supreme Soul, is advising and directing. And we generally have no you know, tendency to listen at all. As a person becomes more spiritually developed, then they are more able to take the direction of the Lord within their own heart. Sometimes it is said that the guru outside of, with, without, his job is to bring a person to the point where they can be fully guided by the Lord within their own heart. So, you know, there may be times, as you said, when we're confused, is this actually an inspiration from the Lord within my heart or is it my mind doing this? So then we go to the other three authorities. If this is the direction that's been given, what does it say within spiritual text or scripture? What does my spiritual master say or what do the previous great teachers or, or other great spiritual personalities say. And if it's in harmony with that, we know it's a direction of the Lord within our heart. That way we don't get misled. Because I tell you what, the gravest danger in the whole spiritual process is to be misled. And it is all too easy, and it is happening massively all the time. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just for clarification, um, um, question. Um, so, is it wrong to ask for help? No. No. Help with what? Help to get a new car? <laughs> I, I, no. You you should ask for help. You know, that is a form of, of surrender. I realize I, I don't have the strength. I don't have the full ability. I, I offer my heart in submission and ask for enlightenment, ask for strength. This is correct way to pray, correct way to ask. I'll just repeat this story just because it's, it's really relevant. Uh, when my dad died, I, I wasn't yet living in back in New Zealand, but I had been visiting, doing something here, and I went to see him over at the Mount. And, you know, it was in the very last part of his life. And we had talked often. Um, he wasn't a very religious person or like going to church and stuff, but he had a 
habit of praying every morning and every evening. And he assured me that he wasn't that afraid of death. He was going to be able to handle it. And the day I went to, to see him, I was only visiting him for about three days. And, and he told me that actually he's becoming afraid now, now that he knows it's close. And he, that was his way of saying, what do I do? I knew that he had this idea of self-reliance, that I'm an independent and strong person. I will always do the right thing. Even though he's a tough guy, he would always try to do the right thing, not cause injury or hurt to others unless they were you know, absolute hooligans causing pain and suffering to others. Then he would step in and do the damage. But, you know, he just had this idea that he had to earn his way into heaven as it goes with the idea through my good deeds. So in taking him for a cruise, I explained to him, I had him in the wheelchair, and I, I explained to him that, you know, there are two paths. One is the ascending path where I feel that it's up to me. It's by my strength. It's by my good deeds. I have to earn my way to the top. I said, there is another way. A person could be, have utterly wasted their life. They could be a drug addict or an alcoholic. They could be lying in the gutter in the process of dying and have a realization that my life has been utterly wasted. I have done no good for anyone. And in a mood of great surrender, turn to the Lord and say, I am unworthy, but I have no shelter. And I turn to you for my shelter in this time where I have no other protection. And I know I am unworthy of your kindness. I am unworthy of, of your embrace, but I have nowhere else to go. If a person died at that moment, they would return to the spiritual dimension. They would not take birth again in this world. They could have lived their life as a complete reject, done everything wrong, but come to that point of abject humility and surrender and be embraced and lifted out of that condition had the full experience of spiritual enlightenment. And I got back to the place where he was and he was kind of big like me and so getting him out of the, the wheelchair was kind of tough and I was struggling with him and then put him on the bed and he goes, you know, what you just told me has completely blown my mind. He said, I realize now that in my life I've been thinking about it all the wrong way. And I need to really think deeply about what you just said. So I asked him, would you like to chant? So we did the Elvis <laughs> for a few hours. And it was really nice. People would crowd in, you know, old people and the doctor and some of the nurses would all come in and stand in the hallway to the room and just listening. And, you know, I know that he was taking, I told him that when the time comes for you to cross this threshold known as death, there is only one thing that you can bring with you. And that is this transcendental sound. This can carry you over this ocean like a boat, the ocean of material existence, and carry you to the shore. You don't have to have any skill or talent. You just learn to completely rest your heart in this transcendental sound, and you'll be fine. It's all good. Simple as that. Okay? 
Haribo. Thank you.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Honey, 